this is a, is a CEO I saw on CNBC. I thought it was really cool, and it's an area that, that, that goes with a lot of stuff that's going on around tariffs, around where uh, devices are going and where transportation is going. So without further ado, I'd like to bring out the CEO of Harley-Davidson, Matthew Levitich. Come on out. Thank you. That fits me just fine. <laughs> wow. Hold on. Be careful. There are no... There it, are no to it totally fits me. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, the reason we're bringing this out here, it's, it's, an, it's an electric bike. Correct. Right, it's your first in a line of e-bikes. Yeah, we, we purchased this company in the first quarter of this year, and it represents the entry level of a full range of electric vehicles that we're going to bring out over the next several years. Okay, all right. This, this is, is to get the littlest of riders and start right. about riding. Okay, all right. So, here, let's move. Let's move. Actually, Too maybe lit. we should move this. Here we go. Okay, um, I, I don't want to keep And it fits over. in the overhead bin. Okay. <laughs> Did you bring it? In there? No, yeah. no, I didn't think so. Um, so. But it does. It does. I want to get to e-bikes in a minute because I think, you know, Harley Davidson has been around 160, 160 some years, based in Milwaukee. Yep. Um, one of the things that you got caught in right away was tariffs. Tariffs, tariffs, tariffs is the, top, uh, is the topic of the day, essentially. It's essentially every time he turns around, President Trump threatens tariffs to everyone. But you were the first, the first, the first company that got really... Uh, under siege by him. And, and I was sort of surprised because I get why he would say attack me on anything. But Harley Davidson was a surprise to me. So talk about that experience. Uh, he, he tweeted at you that you essentially doing making things elsewhere. It's around this whole topic that's just yeah. gained steam. So just to set the record straight, mm -hmm. um, we sell motorcycles in over 100 countries around the world. Over 90% of them are made in our plants in the United States. Uh, the engines have been built in Milwaukee since the very beginning. The, the, the vehicles are assembled in New York, Pennsylvania. Um, if you walk through any of our factories, there's no doubt about the fact that we are heavily invested in American manufacturing, and that is something that we're very proud of and our customers value uh, around the world. So uh, when the tariffs were imposed, and I mean in this case steel and aluminum, mm -hmm. what we were really affected by as a company was European response to that action and the European res response was a very specific retaliation toward Harley-Davidson, Levi's, and Bourbon. Mm -hmm. um, and for reasons they had, they, they targeted specific industries, and in our case, a specific company. And the target was significant. Uh, it raised our duty rate immediately. It was basically a year ago, from 6% to 31% overnight. Okay. And we, we made, Europe's a very important market to us today and more, more so in the future as we bring in new products that play to more of the strengths of the segments that are popular in Europe. So preserving the integrity of that market position that we have is very important. Preserving the distribution channel that we've built over 100 years that we've been in Europe is very important. So passing on those higher costs to consumers would have reduced demand, would have jeopardized our market position. How much would you have had to put our, the price up? Of a, uh, on average, around 2000 over $2,000 a vehicle. A vehicle, on, per, average, on top of the price. On top of the current price. Okay. Um, it would have had a, an immediate and significant impact on our market share. It would have affected the volume and the sales through our dealers. It would have imperiled some of their financial viability. It would have harmed the company. Um, and, and to rebuild that, it would have taken time. So we made the decision to cover that tariff, to pay that toll, mm -hmm. and preserve our retail prices in Europe and carry that burden, which, again, we're a year into it. The annualized run rate on that specific retaliatory tariff is uh, uh, around $100 million, $100 million to the company. Right. So it's not small. Um, it's quite significant in our P&L. Europe's about 18% of our business. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's a, it's a big deal. And when that happened, we had to make some tough decisions about what we were going to do, including not necessarily knowing if and when these tariffs would go away. What would we do to mitigate that cost? We're going to take care of our market. We're going to take care of our customers. We're going to take care of our dealers. And what are we going to do to make sure that the investors don't continue to pay uh, that toll? So what we did was we announced the option to leverage some of our international assembly operations, which exist principally because we want to sell in high tariff jurisdictions 
and the only way to access those jurisdictions at an affordable price is to build is to invest right. in what we call CKD assembly. Mm -hmm. We ship components out of the United States that are assembled or, or fabricated by our company or our suppliers. In this case, Thailand. We have one in Thailand. We have one in India. We have one in Brazil. We've had a plant in Brazil for 20 years. Again, very high tariff jurisdictions that are also large and growing motorcycle markets. Right. Um, we, uh, we ship components and again, from our suppliers and assemble locally, mm -hmm. which allows us to sell at competitive prices. And in those in, jurisdictions. Yeah. yeah. So, so here you are. We could leverage that footprint potentially right. to supply Europe. Right. And we're in the middle of attempting to leverage the Thailand plant to access Europe at that statutory 6% rate, not the 31% rate. And we are awaiting approval. So getting that planning. tweet, now, was it a surprise? Um, I, I wouldn't say we expected it. Right. Um, <laughs> so, um, um, yes, it was a surprise. OK. And, and, and Talk about the reaction to it, because what, what would be the, from a, why would he be right? I can't believe I'm saying that, but there you have it. Well, I, I, I can only speculate, but I, reading between the lines, I would, because some of the comments were sort of like capitulation and sort of you need to stand by the policies of the U.S. government because these are, these are mm -hmm. the things that are going to make the policies effective. Um, we, we run the business based on facts and circumstances. Those are significant costs of the business. We have no idea when the tariffs are going to go. We have to figure out a plan, and our investors want to know what our plan is. Mm -hmm. These are our obligations as a company, and I would say even more so as a public company, right. to disclose what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Why are we doing what we're doing? Now what are we going to do about it? And there was, the, I believe, the assumption in most camps that these would be temporary and they would go away and we mm -hmm. could just ride it out. Well, we're here a year later. Right. And it, they it's haven't gone getting, away. It's getting more. And Well, what's interesting is the European Union, when they drafted that resolution, they put an automatic escalator that two years, or one year in, two years after they put the law in place, that that would go from 31%, uh, another 25% up to 56%. Right. So when they put it in place, they weren't thinking it was just going to go away very fast. Right. And so we're sitting here a year away from the rate going from 26%, sorry, 20, uh, yeah, the, 31% to 56%. Right. So obviously that's $200 million run rate cost of the company. Mm -hmm. and, and should that come to pass, we have to have a solution for Europe. It's a very important market for us. And we can't sit by and wait. You know, the, the U.S. government doesn't unilaterally set trade policy, right. as we've all seen. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. Now, now interestingly, there, this is all on the sales side of our business, and we're quite mm -hmm. unique in that regard. Most U.S. companies are affected on the buy side of their business. Right, they're they buying, they're bringing in. Right. We're not talking about the cost of steel and aluminum, which went up initially. Uh, because we've managed to absorb and find efficiencies, and largely that's a small number. Mm -hmm. We aren't actually talking about the increased, the ratcheting up of Chinese import tariffs because we don't import a lot of components mm -hmm. from China. Mm -hmm. Most of our stuff is domestically sourced and, and manufactured, so we're not as exposed on the buy side. But the sales side in Europe is significant, and the same thing exists in China. The only reason we aren't talking about it as much is our volume is much lower in China. Right. We're still growing the business there, so it's not as big of a so As a business person, because this is affecting tech, it's affecting how do you make, what, what does a business person, all the tech companies are global companies, and you're a tech company as far as I can tell, you know what I mean, like you have, and you're moving into e-bikes. Yeah. How do you manage as a, as, a, as a public corporation, a major corporation, a well-known brand, when you are a global company, when these trade wars have started and they're only escalating. Yeah, well, I, I, to me, the biggest challenge as a business leader is the uncertainty. Right. And so we're, we're making decisions. We make decisions every day, how to deploy capital, where to invest. Should we, you know, for example, the Thai facility, which just came online in the fourth quarter last year, was never intended for any other reason than to supply, supply ASEAN Thailand. market. ASEAN right. market, because right. yeah, there's right. a tr right. trade agreement in ASEAN that we would benefit Australia, from. Australia, all these. Right, so, so now we're left with a decision, should we disrupt that plan and utilize that capacity for Europe? What's the better answer? Mm -hmm. Is this going to go away? How long is it going to last? And so the uncertainty to me is the biggest challenge mm -hmm. uh, for any business leader in the environment that we're in. 
So how does that change? What happens with these as they escalate? Because, you know, they've just had the Mexico thing, whatever that was, you know, because it, it came and went. Right. Now he's just announced new Chinese tariffs, which may not affect you, but as a business leader, and again, like Apple is sure. affected a lot of. Well, I, w I would say, and, and I think the, it's hard for the media to cover this because every company is affected in a unique way, depending mm -hmm. on where they source, where they sell, what are, what are the commodities that they trade in. So we just do the calculus based on our company. Mm -hmm. What are the facts and circumstances before us? What's the decision that we need to make? Obviously, there's some calculus and speculation in the case of, for example, Mexico. Is it going to actually go into effect? How long might it last? Unfortunately, that one was averted. Mm -hmm. I think more so for the auto companies than maybe for Harley, because mm -hmm. again, we do most of our stuff here in the United States, but we do source some things from Mexico, and they would have immediately gone up in cost by five percent, and then ten percent, and then fifteen percent. So, what do you do? What, what, what do you? What should be done by our government? Should these are these important trade wars to have? He's as Prime is telling the farmers this event. It's a hurt now, but it's good for later. You should manufacture everything. Is it possible? To manufacture everything in the United States anymore. I, I think there are certain, I, I have a particular perspective mm -hmm. on, on innovation, which is maybe different than the sort of whiz bang, Buck Rogers sort of things that people talk. To me, innovation comes from know how, mm -hmm. it comes from the daily practice of doing something. And because you do something, you're able to figure out how to do it better. Mm -hmm. And that, and conversely, once you stop doing something, you no longer have the ability to be excellent at it because you're starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. And there are industries that have left the United States that would be difficult to resurrect here in the United States, certainly at scale. Right. Um, and cars or no, not cars, no, but things like you know a lot of a lot of um, textiles and and leather and footwear and you know decades ago. Mm -hmm. So. It, it would be hard, for example, if you were a footwear manufacturer to just simply make the decision, I'm now going to source my shoes in the United States instead of India, Italy, what have you, right? Mm -hmm. Because the know-how doesn't exist. We have um, not so many examples in our business that we're unable to source here, but we do have an apparel division, and apparel is difficult to source at volume in the United States. Yeah. Uh, because the know-how left decades ago, and you can't snap your fingers and create it at scale. Should, do you see you moving less and less manufacturing in the United States, or are you committed to keeping? We, we, we would, I mean, our preference would be to do everything here. And I would say as a company, we have an admirable stance on the content that we source and, and, and fabricate and assemble in the United States. Again, if you walk through one of our factories, there would be no doubt in your mind that we make things. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would invite you to Milwaukee anytime you want to see how Milwaukee. engines are made. Um, and I love it. And we have unionized workforce. We pay well. We have good benefits. And we are competitive mm -hmm. because we work hard at it. And we challenge our suppliers in the United States. Proximity is only an advantage to you when you're competitive with technology, you're competitive with cost, you're competitive with quality, and you're competitive globally. And that's a high standard. But we, we, we challenge and we get the best out of our suppliers because we expect that. And because of that, we're able to compete globally on our merits, building in the United States and shipping predominantly to... Hence why I was shocked that you were attacked, which was really... Well, I, you know, I, it's, it's unfortunate, I you think, given... You didn't respond very well. Well, I, I, don't, I, there, I don't think there's much value, really, to come... You don't that. tweet? I don't tweet. I, I have thumbs, but they don't work so well. We're not so. fast enough. Okay, all right. So you don't um, think there's, because other CEOs have done that. Yeah, I, 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 I don't see. I, I, one of the things that I, we were on the, t on the heels of Jeff Bezos and Amazon and the Postal Service. And, mm -hmm. you know, I watched his strategy, whether it was his or his company's strategy, as being very effective. Just, we're running a business. We're not engaging yeah. in the political theater. And, and yeah, of, course, of course, you know, from a policy perspective. Yeah. What the president and the administration are after, we completely agree with. <laughs> the which the is free and fair trade. We we face ridiculous tariff burdens around the country. You know, the the classic example he uses is 100% in India. Mm -hmm. Now now for the motorcycles, we ship from the United States to India, and we do ship motorcycles complete from the United States to India. It's 50%. Mm -hmm. And getting it from 100 to 50, the the rate on the ones we assemble in India went from 10 to 15, mm -hmm. and dollars 
netted out equal for India. Right. So now the ones we actually invested to build there are more expensive for us to do, and the ones we import are a little bit less. But even take it to 50%. Mm -hmm. right? any, any motorcycle manufacturer around the world gets into the United States for zero. And in every market, including Europe, it's 6%. That's one of the lowest. Most of Asia is between 60 and 100. Mm -hmm. Japan is reasonably competitive. Right. So these are real issues, and they're not just economic trade barriers. There's all sorts of other trade barriers and things like how, intellectual property. How do you property imagine? It, it was interesting. Jeff Bezos didn't react to the post office stuff. He only reacts to sex issues. Um, so uh, I'm not touching that. Okay, don't. Uh, <laughs> don't touch it for sure. Um, so. <laughs> Um, sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm so it's in the gutter. I'm so in the gutter. Um, all right, I'm going to stop to get out of here. Um, when you don't you all wish you were up here? What, what is it? What, what do you think tech companies should then try to? Do you think it's gone for tech companies coming because that's the idea is bring bring it back for tech companies, Apple and the other. You know, I, I personally, my my personal perspective, and I'm not a, in that industry, but mm -hmm. from a manufacturing perspective, um, it's it's less difficult. Um, because it's so capital intensive, so right. that the capital could be deployed uh, in the United States. I think some of the techniques and the labor, the labor more labor intensive technique uh, industries, it's harder if right. they've left. Right. I don't think it would be, you know, we, we, we're, we invest, we have a lot of hourly employees, almost half of our employees mm -hmm. in the company, um, but we also invest heavily in capital, mm -hmm. automation, a lot for safety, and for ergonomic health reasons, we've invested in robotics and things to and lift assist to make sure people don't get injured in our plants. So that is actually part of the reason why we're cost effective is the capital intensity of our business, which is more neutral. So let's talk about that manufacturing, the changes in the transportation. People are riding a lot less. You, you just introduced these e-bikes. Give me the strategy behind doing this. Yeah, uh, so these electric vehicles have been you know, scooters, everything else. It's a great question, and I'm going to, I'm going to, if you mind, don't mind, I'm going to back out a little bit because you know, the, the, from the very beginning, this company was was founded by four young men in Milwaukee in 1903, who who wanted to go farther, faster, more with more fun, right? And that was their whole motivation, and and they created products that allowed them to do that. Excuse me. The pursuit was. Riding. The pursuit wasn't, if you will, the bike, but the activity. And through the entire history of the company, we have been fixated on the ride. Mm -hmm. um, I think in more recent times, it has become, and I say, I wouldn't say necessarily the company, but it, it has become about the object, not the activity. And you know, I like to say to, to people, and just informally, if, if you're a skier, you care about ski equipment, you know about ski equipment, you follow ski equipment, you might mm -hmm. read ski magazines. If you don't ski, you don't care anything about, you don't know anything about ski equipment mm -hmm. or scuba or tennis or golf or on and on. So by, by shifting our emphasis, and I wouldn't say it's a strategic shift, it was more of a strategic epiphany in 2017 mm -hmm. to, to, to establish the headline of our strategy, which is to build the next generation of riders globally, mm -hmm. to make it about the person and to make it about the activity and to make it about, so it's shifting from the noun, the bike, to the verb, you know, the ride, and the experience and the feeling that people derive from riding, to rekindle interest amongst existing riders, former riders, people who haven't yet thought about mm -hmm. riding. Because there's a lot of competition today, right. more so than ever. So much competition for our, our time, which is more limited, our money, which is more limited, and so many more options for um, people to live virtually versus living for real. Mm -hmm. Um, and we believe that we offer this very um, unique, um, thrilling, enlivening kind of experience right, so of riding. And, and, and the existing products that we have are, are a fairly narrow band of how you can participate. Right. So you have, so you by have getting bikes into that have an and image. Other yep. that we can expose well, people. Well, then I would ask what, what took so long in terms of the idea. I, I get an idea. If you have the Harley, which has an image, like this sort of tough, noisy, loud gas. Kind of, kind of, in, your not, opinion. in my opinion, I think pretty much. I think like, hey, I'm going to get on my e-bike, and you know, it doesn't have the same thing. Is that something you thought about? No, of course. I mean, we, you know, we we have coming out later this year um, the other end of the spectrum of EV, which is called Livewire. It is a, yes. it is a super premium, halo 
electric motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And we commissioned a team in product development in about 2012. Mm -hmm. and, and just to, to give you a sense of how we, we design product, we have fantastic designers, and it is about the emotional cues that make a personal connection between the rider and their motorcycle. So we talk about the look of the motorcycle, the sound of the motorcycle, the feel of the motorcycle. They're beautifully designed to elicit an emotional, personal connection yeah. between the person and their product. When, when we embarked on the EV challenge, you know, you can easily get there with look, you can easily get there with feel, and then you go to sound and you think, oh. Yes, yeah, silence, you know, yeah. yeah. What, is, what is that like? Yeah. So we had four people, four or five people, and some seed money. It took them one year to have a running version of basically what we're launching later this year. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it in the summer of 2013 on this little road course outside of Milwaukee. It was a beautiful summer day. I'm completely in my full face helmet and my leathers and everything else. And I'm going up this, this very steep short hill and this very narrow little paved road. And, and I'm thinking I'm 240 pounds and I better goose this thing or I'm not gonna make it up the hill. Right. So I, I lean into the throttle a little bit and as I'm cresting the hill, it actually turns right and drops down. And I'm thinking to myself, oh good Lord, mm -hmm. right? As I'm sort of catching air negotiating this downward turn is I'm having this sort of um, out of body experience with mm -hmm. or off the road experience. I hear birds and crickets and the environment around me. Later on, I had the opportunity to ride with a journalist at 70 miles an hour on a old abandoned airport runway. We were talking like you and I are. Mm -hmm. And it's a different sound. It's so not, silence is your cell Well, it's not what you don't hear. Right. It's what you now hear. Oh, I like that. Okay. Right? Right. Okay. So it is about sound, and this is one of the this is one of the senses. Right. And it activates that sense differently. Right. So again, this is this is actually an example too of the shift from the object to the. So does that change the image of Harley? Of, of I, I think it I think it adds to the image of. I, do, I don't see like a lot of the bikers I, well, I see it, going. What pretty birds. No, but. <laughs> I, I do. You do? Okay. Yeah. We have, all, we have all kinds of diversity. That's true. That's base. a fair point. And, and by the way, this isn't all Harley's now EV and we're not doing that stuff yes. anymore either. Yeah. So it's everything we've ever been plus more. Well, where's the future for your company? These EVs, correct? Well, we, from a technology and regulatory perspective and from a cost perspective, not just the EVs getting less expensive, but traditional mm -hmm. internal combustion getting more expensive, probably there's a convergence coming in the next decade where it will become more electric. Right. So. We're obviously playing into that mm -hmm. from a capability perspective, but our focus is a great ride, and a great ride starts, and the power, with, a great, the power and it starts with a great product that allows people to really get the most out of the ride because that's what it's about. And by the way, EV, and I could, I can't really show you on this because I, I look ridiculous on it, but it's twist and go simplicity. Mm -hmm. So there is no in the, in our live wire product, zero to sixty in three seconds is very mm -hmm. that's very fast, sixty to eighty from an electric. Yeah, 60 to 80 in another 1.8 seconds. So th these are very quick, high-performance motorcycles. They have no clutch. They have no gears. They are twist and go, twist to slow down. Obviously, they have brakes. So the simplicity and the ease of access for people that didn't grow up with manual transmissions and maybe they're less inclined to go through a lot of training, mm -hmm. it, it allows easier access for the next generation of riders. So it's right. part Speaking of the strategy. Speaking of that, and before riders. we get to questions from the audience, Scooter companies, you see them taking off. Your company's worth six billion dollars, right? Is that correct? Something like that. Yeah, that's the revenue. The revenue. Yeah. The revenue. Yeah, it's revenue. Some of these scooter companies have valuations of a billion dollars or more. Right. How do you look at the, all the scooters, the the alternative vehicles? Well, at, at some level, um, it's exciting, right? Because it's creating energy in a in a space for people to. I call it rather than living virtually, living for real, mm -hmm. you know, and they're out there and they have the wind in their hair and whether it's a stand on scooter or a sit on scooter, it's getting people engaged in a fun way to get around. Mm -hmm. we, we talk to young people, urbanization is a macro trend globally, obviously with, you know, differences in buying behavior and mm -hmm. ownership behavior and everything's happened with the next generation of, of humans on the planet. We talk to a lot of them. They, they have the same expression for their desire for individuality, for identity, for, for freedom that we see in our existing customers. It manifests itself differently in an urban environment. So they will say things like, I want something to unlock my city. 
that, that's freedom to them, right? They can get around and they can, um, and, and these platforms are enabling them to see the potential in that. From a, from a business perspective, it's puzzling to me, the, the economics of these valuations. The, I was just in Europe last week and mm -hmm. I don't know how, I can't count how many different brands and formats and, mm -hmm. and their clutter on the streets. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of a Cambrian explosion of yeah. products trying to inspire um, an answer for people. And there'll be some shakeout in that, but I do Would you all get, or get into Harley scooters? Um, it's not out of the question. We have a full, we, we've, di we've um, displayed at, at the X Games this spring. We had a, actually running versions of what we call our lightweight EVs. So they're not traditional scooters, but electric powered, traditional sit-on scooters, same size. Um, very styled, very um, emotively, again, uh, to capture the imagination of people. It's, you don't, people, we believe that people want to, they don't want to sit on a boring commodity. They want to, they want to experience something special and unique, and that's what, how Harley Davidson can differentiate. So we have prototypes we're in development on. Where that will go, how it might manifest itself is still. What's the weirdest right. prototype you have? And then we'll get questions from the audience. Do you have like a floating one? No, uh, not yet. The weirdest prototype. They're not weird. They're all cool. Some of them don't make it to market because there are practical problems or cost problems. But mm -hmm. we have some of the best engineers. What does a Harley look like in 20 years? Cool. <laughs> Questions from the audience, please. Questions? Go yeah. ahead, John. Hey, Matt. John Fort from CNBC. Good to yeah. see you again. Nice to see you, too. Um, Omnichannel is big right now. The blending of physical and digital retail affecting everything from yeah. cars to consumer packaged goods. How is Harley going to operate in an omni-channel world? Are you pushing changes um, for the dealers? What's that going to look like, that digital experience of buying? Yeah, so we, we, it's a great question. And first of all, the, the, the activation that the dealers do for the community of riders is quite a powerful part of the equation, okay? And it's part of the equation we want to uh, extend in these new segments to these new types of riders. And the role of physical distribution is we don't think of it as, I would say, traditional retail in the sense that this is where a transaction happens and that's the only thing that happens there. This is where people meet, they congregate, they, they find like-minded people, they go out for a ride together. Um, it also, in our business, you know, there's a useful role for service, which will probably be less intensive with electric vehicles, but again, we see the traditional vehicles lasting for a long time. So the digital uh, component of it to us helps activate more broadly, recognize how, what are the gateways for people to get interested, learn, pursue, get inspired? How do they augment and help enhance the physical uh, experience? How do, how, do, how do they not just coexist, but actually benefit from one another's presence? So in the true sense of omni-channel, uh, that's what we're after. We, we have uh, people that believe or suggest or speculate that there isn't a role for a dealer anymore, we don't agree with that. And, and there's a lot of work that goes on physically. We have 700 dealerships in the United States. They're almost entirely, well, they're all independent from the company. They're mostly independent from one another. They're owned by individual business leaders. It's not a franchise model. It's a, um, a direct distribution model. So how do we get them all to raise their game individually? There's a lot of individual conversations. How do we get them to buy into some of these new realities of how people want to engage and shop? That's very much a part of our strategy under the heading of stronger dealers and broader access. How do we get them to behave more in, in appropriate ways as one ecosystem of a, re, of a retail distribution center when there are really 600 or 650 different business entities? These are some of the practical realities in how we move forward in, in the day and age where people don't want to see any distinction between physical and virtual and how they engage with products and brands and experiences. So it's very much a core part of our strategy and, and uh, we're deep into it right now. Okay, any more questions? Um, last question, I, when I interviewed Elon Musk earlier this year, he talked about creating a Tesla Motors, well, we'll see if he can do the first part, but, um, but, but he talked about creating a Tesla motorcycle. Um, that he made fun of scooters because I ride them, um, but he was, he was talking about the idea of other vehicles. 
what, who would you see as a big competitor besides the, you know, the other competitors, like the Indian just suddenly got really popular because it looks kind of retro and cool. What, what, where do you see your biggest challenge coming from? No, well, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And um, we actually, the, the most significant effect of our business in the United States is our existing used motorcycles. And, and when you're a manufacturer of new motorcycles, you don't like used motorcycles because they're, they are literally are, are the best alternative to a new Harley is a used Harley for mm -hmm. most customers. When you're in the business of building riders, which is, which is in this mindset shift that we mm -hmm. started in 2017, you actually love used Harleys because used Harleys are, are more affordable, maybe they're less intimidating, I'm not worried about dropping it in my garage, they are a great pathway into the brand and uh, into the sport. So we, when we look at competition, it's, it's a broader definition than just other motorcycle manufacturers because in this case, these are used Harleys. What are the things that are competing for mind share and wallet share? What are people choosing to do and why? And this is why activating the company and our dealers and the marketplace around the power of riding. What do you get from riding? And we, we had a, an ad, I, I've been at Harley 25 years, and in, in 1994 when I joined, there was an ad that said, if we had to explain, you wouldn't understand. Which, which was sort of arrogant yeah. and, and, and convenient because we, at that time we didn't have to explain, there were year long waiting lists, and, mm -hmm. and I, it always struck me as just a cop out. And it is very hard to understand. And it's something that you actually need a level of competency in to be able to enjoy it confidently. Right. And it takes time. And so some of the strategies with EVs and rider training and other things that we're doing and inspiring people to give it a consideration and to try it with twist and go simplicity. And this is where the rideshare platforms and all the scooters are enablers. Are there going to be rideshare motorcycles? There, there might be. I don't know. Oh, there's scooters. Do yeah, right. scooters right now. They're two-wheeled mobility. Right. People are enjoying them. Right. They're getting a, a sense. And you're not for... worried about pogo sticks, right? I... <laughs> All right. Very quick, last question. Yes. Um, bravo. Hi. Camille Manning Broom with the Center for Planning Excellence. My husband got one a month ago, and it has changed his life. For the better, um, right? Yes, for okay, the better. He's, he's out all the time. Uh, I'm a climate change scientist and um, thinking about uh, the future of getting out of our automobiles and especially when we have so much uh, rural and suburban growth, I uh, could see this as uh, a great opportunity um, for abating greenhouse gases. Did climate change or the future of how transportation is going to look uh, have any influence in thinking about uh, this product? Absolutely. In fact, one of the five objectives that we have under our um, Grow the Next Generation of Riders is to grow our business without growing our environmental impact. We have uh, a very um, avid um, climate, I wouldn't call them a scientist, is on our board, Jakin Zeitz. We started a sustainability committee about seven years ago on our board. It's one of, one of the first companies to do it, and he was with Puma and caring, and we have a methodology which is an environmental profit and loss statement where we dollarize every impact that we have from the iron ore to the end of use to water use to the dealer land footprint in our entire business for every product line, and we know exactly how to drive uh, the environmental impact of our product down. The single biggest impact of our product on the environment is product in use. The gasoline it burns for people to enjoy it. Um, what can we do to raise fuel economy? What can we do to uh, reduce the material intensity of our products and the iron ore that we, you know, take out of the ground and turn into forgings and machine and use electricity to do all that and so forth. So we have a very sophisticated and informed view about the impact that we have on our environment and we know then therefore how to drive it down. An EV at the moment, because of how electricity in gener is generated, is not the answer for the planet. But when electricity generation becomes more efficient, becomes more effective, becomes less um, environmentally damaging, uh, electric vehicles are the right way uh, to get around, and they're a heck of a lot of fun. Great. So All thank right. you. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. Thank you.